Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Flow Show. Hope you're doing well. Morning, Kay. You're good. Morning, Ryan. Morning, everybody. Yeah, we're okay, mate. We're okay. Patience yeah. is a virtue, huh? because we are going yeah. to need another uh, nine hours or so, is it, of it? Or eight and a half hours of it? Direct investment news from Germany. Yep, yep. So uh, treading water again. Yeah, there are still some uh, trading opportunities about. Yeah, um, yeah, it's a bit going on. Yeah, still just to keep the uh, accounts ticking over. So, uh, yeah, we'll uh, share our thoughts on the, the FOMC. So we'll get to all the headlines out of the way uh, quickly this time, um, or as quick as I can. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, China has room for another RRR cut says or rate cuts this year as well as an RRR cut says the China Securities Journal or Securities News overnight. Um, however, that doesn't extend to the LPR, which they kept unchanged as expected uh, overnight. Um, the NDRC, the National Development and Reform Committee Vice Chair said economic positivity is increasing, though the recovery will be treacherous. Um, China consumer prices are likely to rebound as demand recovers. The economy is likely to continue its rebounding trend. Um, now, a comment out of the PBOC's Head of Monetary Policy Department said we should pay more attention to the warm rate uh, as an FX basket um, rather than uh, one particular pair. Um, it's uh, gonna correct, going to correct uh, a deviation and stabilise market expectations. Uh, that's the PBOC's job. Um, we've got to start watching a basket now, have we, Kay? <laughs> Another one. Uh, we'll yeah, the I mean... Look at up. <laughs> Yeah, they they actually their their fixing is is already based on a basket, right? So I guess everybody's uh, already uh, watching baskets uh, all around. But um, yeah, I mean the thing is, they they there was a lot of uh, chit chat uh, on on the uh, from from officials overnight, of course, after the uh, uh, them keeping the uh, the LPR unchanged. Um, it, I mean, the bottom line is they still firmly want to keep uh, the FX uh, in check and uh, uh, really keep control over everything. Um, and uh, that's where we are now, trying to uh, trying to to um, keep the uh, speculators away, I guess. But we have to uh, we have to note that um, every day it seems that it's. Um, a bit of a yo-yo, but starting to creep up again, right? Uh, yeah. Is, is not a China. So, um, yeah, and I, uh, I think overall um, they're okay uh, around here, but um, I guess they are going to get more vocal or actually even intervene or so if it, if it goes above um, their 2%, uh, which, is, which is actually not too far from here. I think it's somewhere in the high 731s. Um, on, on the day, um, yeah, they may just keep an eye on it. And, and But the officials will not stop talking because they really want their economy to get back uh, in, into shape and at the same time um, keep speculators away. And uh, yeah, so we can expect them to battle and, and try to massage different headlines uh, every time they, they, they talk probably. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm not reading too much in, into what they say on a day-to-day -day basis for as long as there's no real actions uh, anywhere. Yeah, it seems the uh, sledgehammers are staying in the uh, tool shed for now, uh, as far as uh, company intervention goes. Um, if they really wanted to hit it, they could hit it, um, but they're choosing not to at the moment. But uh, an ongoing situation, which, uh, as you know, we've been monitoring uh, daily. Um, over to Japan <clears throat> and uh, the currency diplomat or currency chief, Kanda, was out saying uh, the usual waffle. Uh, excessive yen moves are undesirable. Uh, watching FX with a high level of urgency will take appropriate steps as needed, not ruling out any options. Um, they did add that they're closely communicating with the US and other overseas FX authorities. Um, now, there's a couple of things in that. Firstly, um, this was a guy who dropped in speculation at his last uh, bout of jawboning. That's not in his comments uh, this far. 
but uh, the communicating with the US and overseas FX authorities um, also was nodded to by US Treasury Secretary Yellen, who said that the Treasury generally understands the need to smooth out volatility in exchange rates, but not as long as it influences Forex levels. Um, any view on Japanese yen intervention would depend on the circumstances. Um, now, being no doubt, these guys are talking every day pretty much uh, on what's happening in FX markets and whatnot. They all know what's going on with everyone else. <clears throat> the, as far as uh, Japanese interventions going, um, they will probably give the heads up uh, or they'll know soon enough when uh, Japan intervenes. It's not a, it won't be too much of a surprise for all those in the know um, if they do. But uh, just some comments there that they do all talk. Um, now, Ali's just asked a quick question um, about BOJ intervention. Um, I said that they will not intervene. They need liquidity to intervene. No, it's not liquidity. It's volatility. Um, that was the key point we were lacking um, when Canda came out with those speculation comments. Um, it's the volatility that uh, is important to them. If it's moving two, 300 pips a session a day, that's too volatile. That's when they really, we're one step uh, from intervention. They can, they don't really care about liquidity per se. If they want to hit it, they'll hit it and they'll phone up uh, their agents, their banks and, you know, send the commands out and the job will be done. So it's not really a question of liquidity. Um, Technical help, I'm not sure what you mean by technical help, if you mean help as in their agents and banks do the job for them, um, yes, they need, they'll get that help. But uh, it's not really help, is it, Kate? It's just, uh, here's our order, go and do it, Kate. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, I mean, the, the, the usual... Um, the usual uh, thing that, that, that happens when they intervene is that they, they likely will... Uh, Call up their agent banks to check rates. That's the last last warning, and you usually see uh, dollar yen drop uh, a quick 60, 70 pips, and 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 likely um, crawl back back up. Um, but then that's usually the last warning. Uh, if if then the market doesn't uh, turn around, they, they probably intervene. But yeah, they 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 do it on. They can do it via various uh, ways. They can call up the agent banks and just ask them for prices and sell. Um, they can ask the agent banks just to go into the market to sell. Then they can, depending on the time zone they do it, they can also do it with the help of ECB and the Fed, who then uh, calls up banks and uh, and, and sells, um, whether it's dollar yen or, or in the case of the ECB, likely the euro yen, uh, but then they sterilize the euro afterwards. Um, so they, they have various ways of doing it. They, they I think they, uh, over time, also got access now straight to the electronic platforms. They used to have it already uh, when, when I was still making markets, but they never used it to actually trade um, just for uh, monitoring uh, purposes then. I don't know um, if there's anything new there um, but um, yeah, they, they, they do have various ways of intervening. The MOF gives the, uh, the green light uh, or the order, I should say, to the, to the Bank of Japan. And then Bank of Japan uh, trades on the, on, the, on the orders of the MOF and, and do their stuff. So um, yeah, there's various things um, that they do. They can have like a kind of fixed amount. They can have like uh, rates they're watching. They can have... Um, um, yeah, I mean, a kind of time they intervene for for half an hour or so, or they can just go sit on the offer. It's it's there's there's different ways for them to uh, to intervene, as as uh, I've ex experienced in the past. So um, what they did last year is just uh, hit the market and um, and then um, sell large enough for the market not to uh, not to get back up to uh, to to rates, um, especially when they intervened the last time above 150. Uh, and then afterwards, they got some help from the uh, from the U.S. inflation. But um, yeah, there's, def there's there's various ways that, that, that they can intervene. Um, there's no panic on on whatever um, means they have or or um, amounts they have to intervene. They are still sitting on 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 about a trillion dollar of uh, of FX reserves, so that's not going to um, 
to uh, to be a big problem right now. Um, so yeah, that's about it. Yeah, thanks, mate. Um, now Bloomberg wrote up the piece uh, saying that uh, BOJ speculation moves to negative rate policy from the yield cap uh, speculation, which is uh, probably about right considering your readers' comments last time around. That's what we're expecting, or I'm expecting for the BOJ on Friday that uh, we perhaps get some clarity on those comments from him um, as to whether he meant them as the market took them or whether the market took them wrong. And uh, it was just potentially one option of many that uh, may happen if things all go according to plan. Um, so that's uh, Bloomberg highlighting uh, what we already knew over here. Um, on the data front, uh, we had some trade balance data again. If you can't really take the numbers in this um, too much. Um, you know, it was down 66 billion last time. It's now down 930 billion. What is important, though, is the activity numbers, further losses in exports and imports, further negative numbers there. So, you know, that's a, a sign of activity coming down. So it's not really good news, but uh, this thing flies around this trade balance. Um, so I'm not uh, not going to pay too much attention to it at the moment, but the continued uh, negative numbers in the imports and exports, uh, if they continue, then maybe that's uh, something that will be affecting um, the economy going forward. Um, but for now, just uh, wishy-washy on those numbers a bit. Um, coming over to Europe and the Bank of Spain has raised its inflation forecasts, uh, a bit worried about higher oil prices. Um, so they've upped their forecasts there. Um, Germany, um, PPI data, which, uh, where is it? Can't find it. There it is. No, it isn't. There it is. Um, bit hotter on the month than expected, um, but matching the year-on-year -year expectations minus 12.6%. Um, we know that German inflation has been a little bit stickier, um, but the PPI coming down now, at least on a year-on-year -year basis, shows uh, that some of those effects may start to wane a bit. Um, the SMB, or rather the Swiss government, sees uh, 2023 inflation up at 2.2% 2 .2 and 2024 1.9%. Uh, so that 2023 forecast still above the SMB target. And that's got a few people uh, thinking that uh, that perhaps nails a hike uh, that's expected uh, this month. Uh, do you think uh, that changes uh, the picture at all, that inflation? Uh, I mean, it's uh, it's the Swiss government giving the green light to the SMB for tomorrow. Uh, that's how I read it. Um, because the actual numbers are... are, are not above two percent. If I'm uh, if I'm correctly, I saw uh, wasn't Swiss inflation just under two percent already? I, I I need to check it. I'm not. Yeah, I think so. Was it one point nine or something? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, let's see, Switzerland. Um, okay, I'm I'm going to uh, to look it up. Yeah, um, you check it. Yeah. Sorry. I say you, you check and I'll waffle on if you want. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 that's fine. I'm going to check it in the meantime. Yeah, so it, it does give the, um, you see, the last inflation rate was at uh, at 1.6%. So um, I've got it already in, in August. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's giving the green light to the SMB to do one, uh, to do one more. And um, I think SMB comes out tomorrow before we, we do the show, right? Um, yeah, 8.15, I, I think. My view there is that they probably will do the one, the, the, the extra one. Um, and that's still going to put the Swiss rates only at 2%. What I am really looking at in, in the SNB, um, well, regardless whether, whether it is their meetings or, or whenever they, they talk, is that it's at some stage, they're probably going to give us the nod saying that they are happy with where things are. And um, that is probably meaning that they will not um, continue to incessantly buy, uh, buy Swiss franc because that's the big thing really that happened once the whole process started is that they, that they said that they sold, that they would uh, buy Swiss franc to, to, to combat the, the inflation as well. I'm just waiting for the moment where they give us the nod and say, we're happy with, uh, with where things are. And then I think the Swiss franc could actually 
quite rapidly weaken a, weaken a few percent. They will continue to probably say, we are keeping an eye on it and we are going to stand ready, blah, blah, blah. But I think there is going to be a case where, um, yeah, take Euro Swiss, which is probably the cleanest uh, of, of the trades, um, where it is bottoming out. And I think we are really in those low 95s, high 94s. I don't see too much of a reason um, for it to, to, to really go much lower than that. And I'm waiting uh, for a signal of their, uh, on, um, from them to say like they're happy with things uh, uh, right now. It, could it be tomorrow? Could be because they only have a meeting every quarter, right? So they need to choose their wording uh, um, wisely. So that's what I'm going to look uh, for in the, the SMB uh, um, decisions and statement tomorrow. But in the meantime, as you say, the government is giving the nod to the SMB to, to, to go ahead, in my opinion. Yeah, thanks, mate. Um, right, coming over to the UK and the CPI data came out much softer than expected. Headline inflation was expected to rise 7.0, 7.1%, depending on who you were looking at. Came in lower than last month, 6.7%. Um, the core as well coming in lower than expected, uh, confirming a the drop there. Um, now, not too much of a surprise uh, for those of you who've been following the flow show, because we've been saying that uh, inflation from last month was going to be uh, the tipping point, and it's uh, continuing again. So inflation going the right way. PPI as well going the right way. Not uh, down as much as expected, to only 2 0.3% loss there versus 2.7 expected. Um, on the input side, output side as well, not a bigger fall uh, as expected, but still going down. Small gains on the month. Um, so CPI and PPI roughly going the same way. What is the concern is this RPI. Um, this is the retail price index. Um, it's more you can, it's another form of core, if you like, um, but particularly on the retail side. Uh, so it includes all the, the the food and whatnot stuff going in through there. That's still very hot, running in the 9%. Um, so that's going to be the concern. There has been a quite a bit of chatter from uh, various circles thinking that the drop in CPI um, might be enough to tip the BOE into a pause tomorrow um, and to keep their powder dry for uh, you know any uh, shocks further down the line um according to uh, trader pricing um there's now a 70 percent chance of a hike tomorrow it was 90 percent uh, before the data the rate probabilities is pretty much 50 50 on whether they hike or cut so there's been a big dovish shift in expectations a bit like we saw with the ECB moving to hawkish expectations into the meeting. Well, this has gone the other way. Um, the OIS curve shows that rates going past 5.5%, uh, expectations have dropped. They're now below 20%. They were running around 42% um, prior to that data. So <clears throat> I don't think it changes the needle for tomorrow. I still think they hike. I think the pricing... 25, 30% of rates staying unchanged is probably about right. Um, it will still be a risk if they, uh, um, sorry, it will be a shock if they do keep rates unchanged. Um, but I expect them to hike and we'll probably get a strong signal that they're back on pause and, or if not done, um, talking that, that rates are restrictive language that we heard from uh, the ECB. Um, I think maybe the risk for tomorrow will be the votes um that they come we expected eight to one for a hike i think they might be a bit more marginal um i would go maybe six three and it's just to send a message um that uh, they're done or they're close to being done at the most extreme maybe a five four um that would also indicate that uh, they're done so they can use those votes to send that message um in theory if they all agree that they're one and done then an eight one should uh, should pass um vote for the hike but as i say they could change those votes just to just to in, give the message that they are done on that so that's uh, what we'll be looking for tomorrow but uh, we can jump on all of that tomorrow 
Um, coming quickly over to the US um, and data yesterday, a bit of uh, mixed fortunes. Um, we had uh, the housing data out, uh, which was soft on the housing starts, down some 11 over 11 percent but we're up on the permits uh, which are up just under seven percent so it's uh, a little bit mixed housing starts for those that don't know permits is obviously the application to build houses um, starts are when actual ground is broken on that um, so why this suffered a bit i'm not too sure i haven't seen that much commentary on it um maybe it's going to show some weakness uh, you know having a permit and then putting the costs into actually building might be a factor um so it could be uh, a financing thing maybe the demand's not there for housing it's dropping off um so we need to keep watching these numbers now uh, particularly the starts numbers if that keep if that starts trending lower then we've got uh, some problems in the housing market which we know um isn't looking overly hot again considering the, the MBA data uh, that we get weekly, um, negative mortgage applications week after week after week with very few bounces. Um, so that's been um, raising a bit of awareness uh, that we might see some softening, but that's uh, something we need to keep an eye on. Um, Canada, uh, inflation. To, yeah, go on, mate. Yeah, what, what we need to take into account as well, in, uh, in if we look at... Um, those those housing starts i think is uh is the weather as well um was it not like extremely hot in one part and some flooding in other parts and um i think those numbers can can be and especially due to climate be a little bit erratic and and volatile so yeah. um i guess we need to take several months at uh in in a row and Actually, it's quite funny, but uh, I mean, it's just a detail. But if you look at um, um, the importance that some people give to those numbers and they put the permits importance above the housing starts important, I, I thought it would be relatively the opposite. If you look at what the reality of things are, yeah, uh, you can ask for building permits, but uh, as long as we you, you, you haven't dug the first hole to put in the foundation, um, is, is it really worth um, 100 percent watching those uh, permits right um but but i think yeah we we need to be a bit careful with with housing data right now just because of the climate really yeah it's funny enough because i looked i looked into that data because i was wondering if there was any skew uh you know across the country there didn't seem to be there wasn't like one area mm. um that suffered more than another um mm. that was one of the things i looked for but you're right what you say uh, building permits <laughs> It's one of those things. It's 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 almost like uh, capex, if you if you like, the intention to start building. Um, if that's strong, then it suggests that you know the demand is there. Um, so it's one of those funny numbers that can can look okay in one sense, but then you match it off against the starts, and maybe it isn't such a good indicator. Um, but you know what market commentators are like; they'll take. Uh, They'll spin it as they want to spin it any uh, any which month. But, uh, yeah, you, you're right. We need to watch if this becomes a bit of a trend. Um, and if it does, then it's going to flag uh, some other issues. Um, but then, uh, yeah, as I say, moving on to uh, Canada CPI and much hotter than expected, 4% um, on the headline number. Core measures going up as well. The BOC core going up a pip to 3.3%. Um, all these other 30 ways to count it going up as well. So it was a little bit suspicious because we saw dollar CAD dropping um, pretty much, well, the latter part of the morning coming into the US session. Um, it, it was going all the way down already, down towards that 134 um, that we were looking at. Uh, let's, oh, let's clear that up a bit. <clears throat> So remember that 134 was a big level we were looking at, and it was it was down to the teens when we got that data. So maybe someone had a little sniff of the numbers beforehand, because uh, after the knee jerk, uh, we bounced back up. Um, but it is significant for the BOC because inflation, just taking the headline, it's gone from 2.8, um, then it went to 3.3, then now it's gone to 4%. That's a pretty hefty move up in inflation um we already know that the the prime number turned the boc a bit more hawkish 
um, this isn't going to change that. It's probably going to add to that uh, as well. So <clears throat> we need to watch those expectations. It's likely to keep dollar CAD on the soft side. Uh, we've seen a bit of a bounce today, um, but we're still holding below the break point of that zone. And as you can see, we tapped it and it's held. So technically, broken level is showing up as resistance, um, which is going to keep the pressure to the downside for now until we get above them and 135. Um, but yeah, definitely going to keep uh, the BOC on the front foot regarding inflation. And that was borne out by BOC's uh, Kaziki speaking overnight, saying that they are prepared to hike further if needed. Inflation remains too high and broad base. Um, seeing evidence that uh, demand is slowing from the, the recent tightening, um, the ups and downs of CPI data is not that unusual, uh, but one of the big drivers in the August CPI inflation was energy and gasoline prices. Uh, they can be pretty volatile. Um, it will take a lot of time to sort through the inflation data, given what's going on underneath. Um, so Canada suffering probably from a lot, what a lot of countries are suffering, this uptick in uh, gasoline prices. However, the, a lot of people are pointing to the rally in oil. That is no way coming through so quickly into inflation. There's a good lag, you know, three to six months before it starts coming through. Yes, gasoline prices get hit fastest because if the price of oil goes up, price of gasoline goes up pretty quickly. But for the rest of it, um, there is a definite lag. So we're not going to be seeing all this oil price rise reflected in inflation just yet. That'd be a potential problem down the line, depending on how long and how high oil prices stay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Right, a couple other little bits. Um, US uh, Senator, Senate Majority Leader Schumer said House's GOPS proposed stopgap funding bill is not expected to pass the Senate. No shit, Sherlock. Um, and White House's Kirby says the US wants to reopen military to military communication with China. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, on the oil front, last headline that I've got, uh, apparently, according to reports by Bloomberg, there is one oil firm that is driving the price higher in oil, and that's France's Total Energy. Um, they say that uh, they're buying up because um, there's higher refining margins and uh, a little bit uh, more robust demand. Um, and uh, so they're the ones who are driving the price up in oil. Although uh, we have seen it top out just short of that zone. I was talking about 93s to 94s. Um, so a little bit of a pullback there. Um, maybe they've done buying, who knows? Right, that's uh, it from the headlines. And this, uh, you got anything you spotted with your microscope, Kay? No, mate. I mean, all the rest is more like opinions and stuff. Uh, no, no. No. You've covered it all. Cool. Beans. Right. Um, let's uh, get on by to the way, Fed. Oh, yep. By the way, gold, gold must not be far from their top, uh, from its top because uh, JP Morgan said it could go to 120 and Goldman Sachs above 100. So we probably have seen the top. Oh, well, oil. They, yeah. They yeah. They probably need buyers now to take them out of their loans. Yeah. I think, uh, who was it? Kramer as well. Jim Kramer was saying that. Uh, there's a top in oil, so that's probably on the other side. We probably are going to 100. Um, who knows? <laughs> we shall see. But uh, quite a decent pullback uh, anyway. Um, right, the Fed, the big one today. Um, I've got a feeling it might be a bit of a boring one, uh, unfortunately. Um, we should still get some decent market moves. Um, I still think there is a a bit of a risk that they do hike, um, but I'll, I'll put that still, you know, 25, 30% chance of them hiking. Um, not as much as I'd put on the ECB last week. In theory, they should, or Powell should walk the same middle ground that he walked last time. Um, noting the risks, noting the strength in the economy, making some subtle changes to any weaknesses um, in that point, noting inflation and whatnot. Um, I think the overall message is that they're prepared to do more, but are happy to wait and see how things unfold. Um, they'll push or he'll push the message of the higher for longer because they don't want to undo all the work done so far. Um, 
what happens with the dollar is a little bit more mixed you know if they if they do hike it's going to be a shock uh, but then in a similar situation to the ecb that's probably a one and done type hike um, so any rally in the dollar might then reverse pretty quickly um, if they remain unchanged then again the comments probably won't give much room for the dollar to weaken too much um, unless another hike is further away than what the market believes currently and still penciling in november-ish for the next hike uh, a lot of the market um, so if that looks like changing um, that might uh, put in a bit of a dovish slant to it what is going to be important is the dots <clears throat> um, and the reason the dots is going to be important because again it's about conveying that message um, so it's going to be really important forget the 2023 dots because we've only got uh, a few months left of the year so that doesn't matter too much it's going to be the 2024 and 2025 dots you need to concentrate on currently the low end of the dots and i should be knocking this up uh, while we're talking um currently the low end of the dots or the lowest dot is um at 3.75 percent um the top end is around five and three quarters percent, I think. If you give me a second, I will get up uh, the dots and you can all see what I'm talking about. There we go. So that's the current dot picture. So 3.75 at the low end, 5.75 at the high end. The majority in this sort of four to five and a quarter percent mark, four and a quarter, five and a quarter percent mark. So if they wanna keep the message they stay unchanged and want to keep the message that height that rate hikes are going to stay high for longer you'd be looking for a bit of a step up maybe of these guys here around the four four and a halfs if they step up more around the five let's say we get a, a the majority sitting around five that'll that'll give the porkish slant or at least be reaffirming to the market the higher for longer message <clears throat> likewise with these 2025s um, this might be a bit messy as you can see it really is split a wide range um no one really no majority for any one number this might if that takes the same sort of shape as this at a high level again that's a little bit more hawkish um and also you can look at the longer run just to see if where they think the neutral rate might be that might be stepping up a bit um if that steps up same sort of pattern but if that steps up uh, from here to sort of three percent again that will have the market doing a bit of a repricing where rates are further down the line. So the dots are going to be important, um, but I'm expecting a, a same old, same old message from Powell. How are you, Kay? Yeah, um, exactly. I think um, rate-wise, they, they won't change anything. It, it's like we've been saying that so often it's a bit of a broken record. I think it's going to be data-dependent rates on bit on autopilot right now and then it's going to depend on uh, what they say and <clears throat> also QT running in the background um, which I think actually is is partially respon responsible for um, for the yields being kept up apart from those treasury and, and debt concerns um, but yeah I think the 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 the, the important one um, especially for the 2024 I'd say because the market is pricing in those cuts my what I could see as a base case is is that um, the, the the height of the or, or the difference between um, a bit of more of a concentration towards the the, the top side of the of the four percent range, uh, as you say, I think we can see a bit more concentration in the dots, which would mm. then mean verse uh, um, a bit higher, uh, which would then mean um, higher for longer, right? Um, I don't know if the 2025s will already be important, but I think if the 2024s rise, the 2025s would perhaps mechanically be be adjusted as well a little bit. Uh, they, if, if you hike your expectation for 2024, uh, you're probably going to hike it for 2025 as well. Perhaps not in the same um, on, to, to the same extent, but uh, that's it. And um, yeah, I'm I'm trying to think what the dovish. Well, okay, the dovish surprise would be we are done, okay? Um, but is is not going to say is not going to tell us that because that Powell has been has been um, walking the fine line uh, very well actually, 
and and that reflects somewhere in in where we are in the dollar right now um globally speaking um so i think yeah um watch those dots um and I, as you say, I, I don't think it's going to be a game-changing FOMC meeting today. That's basically my 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 view. And I'll I'll show it um, when I take the screen. Um, that's the option so I could view as well. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, uh, Ali asked um, if the Fed is hawkish. Can we see one fifty on dollar yen? <sighs> I would, you know, I wouldn't rule it out. There's, there's two ways to look at it. If they hike, but they're done, what you're going to have is two things. You're going to have half the market who now has got a little bit more on the carry trade between uh, the dollar and the yen. Um, so there's a reason for them to to jump in on that. Um, but then probably the rest of the market is going to be trading. That's the top. When a rate cuts, let's watch growth similar to the ECB, and likely we're going to see a dollar reversal. So can it spike up there? Yeah, of course. Will it stay up there? That's a different question. Um, and I think it's it's hard to see that happening um, unless the carry traders really come piling in. Um, and in that case, right. then maybe we are heading up there. Um, um, yeah, go on, mate. That, we have to wait for the Bank of Japan to know whether uh, the the uh, the carry trade is uh, full uh, full steam back on. Yeah, if he if so he now we are speculating on if the Fed does this and dollar yen shoots to one hundred and fifty, what's going to happen? But that's not over to the Bank of Japan. That's over to the MOF. If they think yeah. that it's that it's going too fast, uh, re remember Corona when he said moves of two three hundred points per day are too much. And we already had the, the, the warning overnight by Canada saying that they are keeping an eye on markets. I, I don't think Canada meant anything else than, than to say that it didn't mean we are ready to intervene. He, he told the market, we know that FOMC is tonight, Bank of Japan is on Friday, we are watching you. That is the message. So if we see an, an, an abrupt move in, uh, in, in dollar yen on the back of the FOMC tonight, uh, I reckon the MOF could step in and say, like, hey, hang on a little bit here. Uh, we, we are going to, to do something. And then it's over to the Bank of Japan to tell us whether we, we are going to go back onto the uh, carry trade. Um, and and I, we will talk about the Bank of Japan, but it could be, well, any, any meeting now of the Bank of Japan is important, but it could be a relatively important meeting coming up here because of what Ueda may tell us. So yeah. I, I think it's too early to say that, I mean, the, this is going to, I, I really would like to take FOMC and Bank of Japan as a whole to know exactly what the, what the yen is going to do. Yeah, very much so. I mean, you know, if they hike, as I say, I see, I can see dollar yen spiking. Um, can it hit 150 maybe? Um, but then I would potentially be looking at that getting sold off. But then you get to the Bank of Japan. If you either rolls back on those comments he made last week and, and brushes them down, dumbs them down a bit, and obviously they remain unchanged in all their policy stances expected, then you're probably going to see dollar yen rallying again. And that might be the real move um, because that will be, okay, now we've got, what, 5.5% rates. Um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, what's the rate? Five, yeah, five and a quarter, five and a half percent uh, or five and a half, five point seven five percent rates in the US if they hike. Um, and that's a bigger divergence then from the Bank of Japan. So, uh, yeah, and that's that will bring the carriers out. So, yeah, it's you can't just judge it on today, Ali, is the uh, too long, didn't read version of what uh, myself and Kay have uh, just been saying. Um, right, uh, let's have a uh, quick look at the prices. Uh, Kay, do you want to have a, the first look at it? Uh, oh, it's, it's, it's as, you, as you wish, mate. I, I, I guess we are going to be looking at relatively the same pictures, yeah. Let me yeah. uh, quickly show you this then. So what we are um, looking at, uh, and and we have this uh, this uh, funky widget on our uh, on our page on our forex analytics page uh, for the guys in the room. Um, always good to to have a look at what the option market is pricing. So we're trading around at 107 on the euro, and look at what the options market is trading. This is the overnight, okay. Um, this is not what they expect to be around, but this is what you're going to uh, be paying for a straddle. You add up the both plus 
some uh, some spreads that you're going to pay away um, as a retailer. So 51, let's say 55 pips is about the same that they were pricing over the um, over the ECB. So the market doesn't think that the Fed is going to be a big thing today. Yes, there's a bit of um, uh, a bit of volatility priced in the overnight because we have the event compared to what the the one month is. This is normal to to, to see this, right? But you can judge by <laughs> how nervous or relaxed an option the FX options market is, which is a pretty deep market, by the way, um, on on how they price the uh, the event and the event. Um, you price it to take the add the money uh, where we are now and um, see what they price around the event. So 55 pips. If you would buy a straddle, that means that you're looking at a range, possible range uh, of 107.5, 106.5. Um, that would be the boundaries. And as we have seen pretty much over the past meetings, apart from after the ECB, we had a bit of a, a, a move lower than, than where they priced it. But the, the options market has been pretty accurate over the past events, okay? So keep that in mind. If you're looking for um, moves after the event that you likely are going to be finding interest both sides of this uh, of, of the range. And uh, you add both up, that means that uh, 106 and a half, 107 and a half is likely going to be the boundary of the range today. And if you can, and if you look at it, there's not a lot of difference. There's no, there's no skew. The, 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 that's the blue line here, which is current. There's no skew. So the market is not really thinking that is going to be a game changer one side or the other. Um, if you look at the yen, for instance, um, there's a bit more of a skew for uh, for for the top side. Okay, um, and it's priced at around seventy points, which is about. Yeah, which is about the same actually as in uh, euro dollar. So no, no big, um, no big dramas there on the um, on the expectations for the uh, for the FX market for the to, today's event. Okay, um, and if you look at for instance, I'm, and I'm just going to front run the um, the Bank of Japan just a little bit because this is interesting. If you look at it, the oh, it just changed. Okay, so. The, the market here is also looking at where, um, is also thinking that uh, the Bank of Japan is not going to change much. So the skew is a little bit for the top side. So the market thinks that it's, um, it is possible that, uh, well, you have a little bit of a, a swap in there as well, but it's possible that the Bank of Japan is not doing anything or, or Ueda not giving us anything. So they, they're ready to pay up a little bit more for the, for the top side. That's the... Uh, the uh, a bit of option stuff for you guys. Um, yeah, just quickly, euro dollar yesterday is high around 107.15. We are not too far from it. That's uh, the first level. I think if we start to get up to those uh, um, higher 107s in the current scenario uh, of, of how the dollar and the euro behaves, I reckon we would find some Resistance, we would find resistance up there. It's really if we start to break 108 that the, the, the picture is going to change for the euro, I think. Um, if not, then we trade ranges. I also don't see too much of a reason for this FOMC to take its sub 106.35, but therefore we will have to watch what the yields are doing. They are ticking up those those yields on, uh, on, on the dollar. Um, they are ticking up everywhere, um, but uh, on the dollar in particular, when it's the biggest market. And then, as usual, you have to look for the euro dollar at what the uh, short term differentials are doing post FOMC. If we get a disappointing FOMC, then the, um, the differential should be tightening. And then we will have to watch very carefully what's going to happen around minus 170 to minus 165 BPs. Okay. All things equal. Um, Powell being, I, I think he's going to be very neutral. Um, I reckon this is not going to move too far away from where we are now. I think maximum back down to 190 BPs from 180. That's roughly what I'm uh, expecting from the, uh, the today's moves. Um, well, we have to look a bit, we have to look at Dr. Cat because we have a little of a, a little bit of a team thing going on, a, a team thing going on on Dollar Cat after 
last night's uh, uh, yesterday's CPIs, we well most of us actually bought this uh, bought this dip um, into 134 and just below. Um, I've been already offloading quite uh, a, a, a little, not quite a bit, um, about half actually, um, of what I have on. Um, for as long as we are not going above 134, call it three quarters, uh, 135 the figure, um, we still have to um, to think that this thing here could be on for a, for a break back down. So I'm trying to be very careful with, uh, with what... Um, I'm doing at least here. If it goes below 133, three quarters, 70, um, I guess there's no no reason to keep that dollar cat. But in the meantime, keeping an eye on uh, on what's happening in oil as well, uh, distant eye. Um, it looks as if we found some decent uh, decent support here at least. And now it's over to the FOMC to tell us what uh, what people want to do with this. Um, I'm thinking that I might misunderstand this market a little bit because I'm I've started to catch a knife here uh, in the in the dollar noki. Um, I'm going to load a bit more up in this uh, in this zone here down to 1070, 1072. Um, but if it goes below uh, 1068, I'm probably going going to be out of it. I thought with oil um, starting to 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 come off natural gas coming off as well that uh, we should have a little bit more support uh, for the dollar noki or, or, or euro noki but perhaps the market is already trading uh, tomorrow's Norgas bank that uh, which is expected to raise by a quarter point uh, as well their interest rate so um one to watch thought it would be uh, a good idea to to buy into this zone but i'm uh, starting to doubt myself here. So I'm going to call, play it very, very cautious, keep my amount small, and uh, that's where we go from here. Um, dollar yen, yeah, we, we, ah, me, I need to talk about cable quickly. Look what happened on the, um, on the uh, CPI. We came to tag this, uh, this, this trend line here uh, in the 123.30s. That's your, um, um, support right now, and I think we can extend it over the uh, FOMC tonight if the cable turns south again um, to down to 123, the figure where also the prior low is. So this level is going to be important on the FOMC today. Okay, this is going to be important. Very short term, perhaps um, the the level yesterday, but then I would rather look at the 124 and a half um, as um, as um, Point of measurement on the top side. If we start to go above 124 and a half, I think then uh, um, cable could trade higher, and that would perhaps mean that uh, Mr. Powell gave us something rather dovish to uh, to chew on. Um, I'm a little short here, but um, I'm not going to be a hero, so my average is pretty okay. If this goes back uh, above 124 and a half, I'll be gone and um what else i don't know i don't really know what else to talk about the dollar yen is is just slowly slowly ticking higher we are above the prior highs but um fomc is going to decide whether we go to 148 80 85 or if it's a straight line to 150 again we have said uh with ryan uh and i and i I kind of agree because if you do, if you print close to 150 on the, F, on the FOMC, I think a few officials are not going to be happy. And we still have the Bank of Japan to come. So caution, if caution, 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 if we would go very close to uh, to this level, I'd say. For as long as we are, on the other hand, trading comfortably above uh, 147 for a starter, um, Nothing has changed in the global picture. It's still pretty big. And that's it for me, Ryan. Over to you. Thank you very much, mate. Um, I'll just uh, grab it back quickly. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, just to go back to a point um, Ali was making about uh, a bit of a bias. Um, and Angela quite rightly said, you know, you shouldn't really have a bias um, <clears throat> going in, you know, a feeling about what uh, there may be you you can have feelings but 
you don't want to let them influence you too much. Or if you're going to trade those feelings, know where your risk is, um, know which side of the trade you're on. Um, what if it all goes wrong? Don't plan on what can go right, plan on what can go wrong. Uh, but Ali also mentions that he's got a, you know, why does he, why should he fear big events? If he has a 50-50 trade probability on each, why do you fear a risk event? There's two ways to look at that. One, um, there's almost a higher chance of your 50% wrong coming up over a big event because there's bigger price risk around such big events. If you've got a 50-50 trade on, um, risk reward or whatever you want to call it, uh, and when there's nothing going on, you've got nothing really to affect that. But when you've got a big risk event, um, there's two things. A, there's a higher chance that one of your 50s gets hit, and uh, law of trading averages suggest that if you're on a 50-50 on a big event, you're probably going to be wrong more than you are right. But also, you have the risk that if there is a big move, um, your first price is through your stop anyway. And so you get a worse stop than what you had in the first place. Um, you know, if, uh, if there's a sudden gap in a pair, um, your 50% uh, or your your one-to-one -one risk reward or whatever um, could get blown out of the water because you get stopped at a far, far worse level than uh, you had originally set. Um, that's why a lot of people, and I do, and I know Kay does and others do, they scale down um, any trades going in. If, you know, I'm I'm long dollar yen 147 um, and 147.66, um, we're up here at 148s. I'm probably going to scale down my 66s into the FMC. I might even take them all off. Um, I'm happy to leave the 147 part on because there's, I've got a bit of margin to play with. Um, I don't have to react so quickly. Um, so I might just reduce that risk. I may be wrong in doing so, and it may show up to 150, but I'm all about managing my risk um, because I've got an equal chance of that going down to 147 and I, and I have it going up to 150. So I don't want that risk. Um, I'd rather take my money off the table lower my risk, just manage what I've got to better levels and better margin, give myself the time to adjust the trade if need be um, or stay in or even add back. You know, you can always add back after the event if you still like the trade. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing that at all, but it's all about just managing your risk. Um, and that's what you see with a lot of traders doing. You know, this is probably going to get really jumpy closer to the FOMC. You know, longs will be exiting, shorts will be exiting. And, you, you know, you'll probably see it flapping around in a, a 30, 40 pip range uh, just while traders do that. Just take chips off the table. Um, that's all you've got to be careful about. Anyway, as far as we're concerned, the talking is done. Um, obviously, you can catch us on the face show and uh, for subscribers, uh, the other shows during the day and then run up to the FOMC, um, which we will all be covering uh, live later in the chat room. So good luck today. Stay safe. If in doubt, stay out, come back afterwards, um, you know, pick up the trades once you know how things lie. Um, take care, everybody. Thank you very much, K-Man, for your thoughts and uh, good luck to you as well over the FOMC. Yeah. Yep. Good luck, everybody. Have a good yep. day. We'll don't yep. do anything we'll what I wouldn't do, but don't do any, don't, don't put your account at risk. It's not worth over one... Uh, okay yeah exactly it's day, always guys. another trade cheers everyone hey traders this is blake morrow with forex analytics thanks for stopping by our youtube channel don't forget to like these videos share them and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of the content that we provide here for free thanks for stopping by i'll see you in the next video Thank <laughs> you.